Your job isn't to make the bike move. Your job is to keep the bike upright. Those of us who are the true educators, we really want to be given the opportunity to educate the whole child. We can get free college degrees based on all of the opportunities that are out here and available to our students. Oftentimes, as parents, I think we want to protect our kids, but I think one of the greatest gifts we can give them is allowing them to experience adversity. Yeah. Here's your host, Janita Bailey. Well, welcome to School Days, Help for Moms and Dads of school Age Kids. I'm Danita Bailey. Are leaders born or are they developed? You may have one of those little ones who naturally has a line of kids following behind him or her, or you may have one that feels best flying solo, or both, really. Leadership is both innate and a developed skill, but how do we as parents bring the best out of each personality? Recently, I came across a TED Talk by Adora Svidtak, who was 13 years old at the time. In her talk, What Adults Can Learn From Kids, she shares about the importance of giving kids opportunities to be leaders. Let's take a listen. I loved to write from the age of four, and when I was six, my mom bought me my own laptop equipped with Microsoft Word. I wrote over 300 short stories on that little laptop, and I wanted to get published. Instead of just scoffing at this heresy that a kid wanted to get published or saying, wait until you're older, my parents were really supportive. Many publishers were not quite so encouraging. One large children's publisher ironically saying that they didn't work with children. One publisher, Action Publishing, was willing to take that leap and trust me and to listen to what I had to say. They published my first book, Flying Fingers, you see it here, and from there on it's gone to speaking at hundreds of schools, keynoting to thousands of educators, and finally today, speaking to you. No matter your position or place in life, it is imperative to create opportunities for children so that we can grow up to blow you away. Adults and fellow Tedsters, you need to listen and learn from kids and trust us and expect more from us. You must lend an ear today because we are the leaders of tomorrow. Before we go any further, let me just say it, say it does take a village. If you hear a great parenting tip or nugget of advice, share it with your parent friends. Facebook it, Instagram it, tweet it, link it in, and add the hashtag School Days Show and hashtag I Am School Days. And also, we want you to be a part of the show. So if you have any questions or comments, give us a call at 214-431-5062 or find us live on Facebook at Noggin Foundation. That's N-O-G-G-I-N, and you can drop us a question there. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce my guest for today, Mariam McGregor is Director and employee of Employee Engagement and Organizational Strategy at TCU and a nationally recognized leadership consultant who works with schools K-12 in higher education, nonprofit agencies, faith groups, and communities interested in developing leadership efforts for kids, teens, and young adults. Mariam lived in Colorado for many years where she served as the school counselor and coordinator of leadership programs at an alternative high school and received honorable mention for counselor of the year. She also worked with college student leaders and was a youth volunteer trainer for Nightlights, a respite care program that serves families of kids with special needs, and Epic Mentors, a program started by one of her sons at his elementary school that pairs peer mentors with kids with learning challenges. She lives in Texas with her husband and three kind kids. <laughs> I like that you put that. It's <laughs> an important characteristic. It is important. Yeah. It definitely is. So thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. it, my pleasure. Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump right in. we got a lot of questions and not a whole lot of time. So I mentioned in my intro, um, natural born mm -hmm. leaders. Is that such a thing? Are there people who are natural born leaders? Yeah, that's a pretty common statement, actually, no matter what the age is. We see it in adults as well, that people will, will declare that someone's a natural-born leader. Uh, I think there are people that have natural behaviors that we are attracted to when we think about wanting to follow someone, that they are able to speak clearly or motivate people or um, energize people. And... Uh, so I think it just comes out more naturally for some people. I think by about kindergarten, fifth grade, I mean, five-year-olds, kids can tell 
Um, they might claim that they see someone that's a leader, and it's typically at that age, the person that's the loudest, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but I think that the most natural piece about leadership is that everyone has the potential to be one. Yes. That is this uh, creating opportunities in these environments where kids, no matter what their behaviors are, because I don't think the best leader is the one standing on tables, mm-hmm. you know? wrong people on um, and I do think that everyone has the ability to develop leadership skills yeah. some are just more naturally inclined towards it mm-hmm. and we have pretty stereotypical descriptions that will say oh that person is a natural leader mm-hmm. which typically means they're bold or they're you know they're out there sort of thing and I think m- misinterpreted leadership skills are those of the reserved individuals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you think, just really in your opinion, are there people that are more kind of born to be supporting in a supporting role than more of a leadership role? Oh, that's, you know, we all are, actually. I Mm. think there's, everyone has that sense of um, if your leadership skill at that moment is not to be the front of the house, is not to be the one that steps up and makes things happen in a really obvious way that too is leadership it's that ability to know when to step back to know when to support um i I guess it's that humility piece that comes Mm -hmm. for leaders Mm -hmm. is the ability to say now is not my time to speak up and yet to still be able to advocate and support people that are speaking up for the positive um certainly i would want to show restraint if it's someone that's like at the point where someone's doing something negative at that point step up (laughs) um so yeah, I think that we all, we all at different times, there's the opportunity to step back. Mm-hmm. And that is the leadership skill that you're using at that moment. It's just the strength of being able to recognize it's someone else's time in that moment. Yeah. So as parents, we're kind of trying to figure our kids out mm-hmm. as they're growing. <laughs> so what would you say are some of the characteristics of people that are going to be strong leaders? Oh, well, can we drop the word strong first? Sure. Why do yeah. you want to drop it? <laughs> well, because I think, again, those characteristics of leadership, um, there's, there, it's not necessarily something about strength so much as it's something about are they able to engage with other people in a way that allows those people to also be their best selves? Mm-hmm. Is it something that... Um, you know, in, is that sense of empathy, that sense of being able to repair... Re- like respond to the other person or to have a different perspective or to share a different perspective. So I think the strength piece comes in and is knowing who you are and being able to be the one that says, I'm going to be the one that stands up or advocates or um, communicates in a way that gets a message across. So I think we sometimes get caught up in the, you know, that strength is sometimes really quiet Mm -hmm. and that ability to be able to, um, yeah, again, not you don't always have to be the one on the tables. You don't always have to be the one that is, um, I don't know, speaking the loudest, so to speak. Um, so figuring kids out and figuring out what would be building strong leadership or s- leadership characteristics. Well, first, I'd love to figure out our kids just in general. Just in general, just right? Just in general, right? Like who are like, you? What are you here for? Right, right? And that telepathic piece. I'm like, I just want to sometimes. (laughs) So asking the right questions, which maybe aren't the right questions at that Uh point. Or again, when cultivating leadership is being able to step back with your kid and let them give us the language that you need to have at that point of, I know what I can do right now. Mm -hmm. Go back to the beginning of the question. It was like, what are some of the common characteristics? Yeah, or yeah. Something okay. that's gonna help you to be a leader. And a couple of yeah. them, them that I thought of was ability to negotiate. Yeah. So yeah, how do you yeah. do? How do you build that in a child? Right. I would actually start with that perspective of navigate before I even get to negotiate, because negotiate is suggesting that there's a win or there's a loss. Um, whereas navigating means I recognize that you have a different perspective than Mm. me and I'm going to figure out what it is that you need in order to get what I need, which is, that is part of the art of negotiation. Right. And, um, because I'll tell you, one of my kids is a really good negotiator, crosses a line sometimes where it's like, this is not a negotiation situation right now. (laughs) This is a clear statement of, uh, you know, I said, yeah, no, or, um, oh, you mean this with is you. A, oh, yeah. Oh, they love to do oh, that. Oh, they love <laughs> to do it. So I'm not sure that that's necessarily the characteristic that we want to 
develop so much is it's the communication piece of can you um, have conviction in what it is that you believe and be able to state that in a way mm-hmm. that also honors the other person mm-hmm. because that is negotiation in that in that situation right that sense of what do you need mm-hmm. and how do I communicate with what you need um, and I think that's one of those pieces of leadership is no one ever wants to feel like they're gullible or mm-hmm. taken advantage of mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. No one wants to feel like someone th- is looking down on them or feels like they've got something above them. And I think sometimes that's what comes out with the negotiation language. Mm-hmm. Um, now, self-advocating, absolutely. Should yeah. a kid, should we be building those and should sound super prescriptive, but do we want our kids to be able to neg- to self-advocate Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they have to navigate an adult situation sometimes? Absolutely. And with that comes the time when they have to, again, step back because at some point trying to persuade you to give me something or to get to a certain end game becomes abrasive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I've defeated my goal of being a leader Mm -hmm. at that point as well. You've lost them. You've lost them because I'm no longer um, connected to you by what you need. I'm connected only to what I need. And so Mm -hmm. I'm no longer negotiating. Yeah. I've cut it off. Yeah. So. um, Something that you kind of touched on was um, teamwork Mm -hmm. and the ability to kind of collaborate. How how is that something that we can help our kids to to grow in? Yeah. I know they they work on that a lot at schools and particularly now instruction um, type is starting to switch to from just standing at the front of the the room and talking to the kids and more putting them in groups and giving them kind of project-based learning. So what kind of things can we do at home to help them to work as teams? Yeah, that's great. I mean, because we as parents are often very instructive, uh, you know, we're going to train you, so to speak into, you know, like, and because I do learning and development with employees and our ultimate service base at TCU is students, which again, they're still students right like that's how do we cultivate this these citizen leaders people that go out into the world and they become the ones that we want to live next door to um so the whole piece at home because project-based learning isn't that what home is a lot of times it's project-based learning like hey we've got something that we've got to do let's work on it together uh so i think as parents it's also giving the opportunity of it might feel slower to engage <laughs> to engage your kid in oh helping gosh. make a meal. Uh-huh. It might feel messier. It might feel like your end game is just being like dragged down. But ultimately, we're raising not kids, but we're raising adults. Yes. And if the skill that we want our kids to have is, can you work with others? Key workplace competency right Mm -hmm. collaboration critical thinking creativity um, all of those pieces when you look at the top 10 workplace competence adaptability flexibility Mm -hmm. i don't get that if i'm only working for myself right or working with myself i gotta work with you right to be adaptable and flexible and uh, that's just a very different language i'm sure some people have kids that are like i just don't want to work on a project with anyone I just want to do it myself. One of my children, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And at that point, my response to them is the best skill you can have as a leader is to be able to work with other people Mm -hmm. because I know you can do it. That's not showing anything. What you're showing when you step into a space with other people is your ability to actually be the true leader because you can dial back some of your things that just try to, you know, like try to barrel through or get things done. And you really, again, build that empathy muscle Mm -hmm. of engaging with someone else. And to me, when leaders are able to step into someone else's shoes, to take that fly on the wall perspective and be able to go, wow, if I look at this situation and I'm not trying to instruct you or I'm not trying to train you or I'm not trying to tell you how to do it and we can do that together, that's what project-based learning does. It's what collaboration does. And ultimately, those are going to be the really employable individuals. Right. And also, one of the beautiful things about working in a team as a leader is they get to know you. You mm-hmm. start to build relationships. There's so often, at least I've had bosses where they're kind of on high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't come totally. low. Totally. Right, know? right, right. But if you collaborate with people that you're leading, they get to know you and you get to know them and that that that's just a recipe for for a good project being absolutely done. Mm-hmm. and it's that sense of if i can value your gift and your gift is that you can like 
I mean, I'll admit I'm not super methodical, right? Like having to go step by step by step to everything doesn't work for me. I have team members though that are super methodical and I value that in them because they keep my tangents from going all over the place. (laughs) Now, if I had to engage that, I can. Um, But to me, that tells me that they know what their leadership skill is mm-hmm. and it's moving through something in a, in a methodical way. Yeah. Um, and it, it is, it's honoring their, just their skill and their gift to be able to go, you know what, we can, we can move ourselves forward. I'm going to use something different than you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it makes us a better team, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. Um, what are some of the ways that you can help them develop critical thinking skills? Oh gosh, isn't that a good one? It's a great one. Uh, right? I mean, can we start with not just our kids, but adults too, like right. just just going deeper. I mean, that's one of those things is that we have the nature of wanting to just live in the shallows mm. and not wanting to dive deep and diving deep relies on relationships. Mm-hmm. I have to have this sense that you want to be there with me, but I also have to have the willingness to say, I want to be there with you and that we might have to go through something that in our relationship as a leader or as leaders with each other, we're going to have to again navigate a little differently right Mm -hmm. we're gonna have to navigate it differently um so there's some activities that you can do to help develop critical critical thinking thinking. yeah i mean some of it is again that slowing things down Mm -hmm. because when a child says what do you think about x y and z As parents, we want to get in there and give them advice. We want to get in there and step in and tell them exactly what we think. Mm -hmm. And the richest thing we can do for a kid is to say, well, what do you think? What do you think? Yes. Well, no, 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 mom. I want to know, what do you think? Or when they say, did you know that, um, I don't know, you know, did you know that the first car came out in whatever? Our nature as adults, we have the curse of knowledge. So we're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally know what came down. And did you know? And we're pushing it back to our kid. Like, did you know this other fact versus I did not know that. Tell mm-hmm. me more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because now it's not, I don't need to critically think. I mean, I do. But with my kid, if we're cultivating critical thinking, we have to slow down on giving an answer about something. It's the same as our colleagues. You know, when a colleague says, I want to work on this project, the, the next question would be, well, tell me more about what, how you're seeing it come out. Mm-hmm. You know, what is your vision? What is it that you want to see happen? Um, what would make it successful for you? Same for critical thinking with kids. What would make you feel really confident about that? Mm. Or um, So it's really those open-ended, non-advice-giving things that cultivate critical thinking. And it requires slowing things down, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is, it can be difficult for it me can. in particular. Mm-hmm. A- everyone, yeah. you know, we're very busy, so to speak. And yet the, the busyness, just to drop it with our kids and to be in that moment, mm-hmm. and that sounds so just uh, cliche, and yet it's not, is just to be engaged with our kids in a way that says, I see you. You know, I know you don't know what I know. Um, with other adults, we can look at each other and go, I know you know what I know. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but with kids, they don't. Yeah. And so when we see situations where leaders do something, we're like, oh, gosh, I don't want my kid to do that. Or, wow, yes. I wonder what my child thinks about this at, at different ages. But, like, five is a very different conversation around critical thinking. It's very developmentally, um, like, there's a right and a wrong and there's a judgment and there's a non-judgment there's but at 16 it's a totally different conversation and then I have a college age kid at 20 it's a very different conversation which says well have you looked at all sides of the issue that's critical thinking versus hey I get that you feel really strongly about that have you thought about this and that requires going deeper yeah yeah grit and the growth mindset are kind of mm-hmm. buzzwords that you mm-hmm. hear a lot around schools and with students and whatnot. How is that important in development of leadership? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's go with the growth mindset piece of it first, mm-hmm. because I think, uh, you know, there's that, there is that perspective, like growth is a choice um, and having a fixed mindset is I've learned as much as I can learn. And are there individuals that that's just the nature of where they are, depending on their experience and their perspective and whatever that they've gone to at that point? Absolutely. Um, I've learned what I've learned, so to speak. And while it might frustrate people with a growth mindset, 
there are times where I understand where someone's hit that point or that season in their life. Um, certainly it's very frustrating when kids say that mm. because you're thinking, well, honey, have you thought about this? Um, because again, we have the curse of knowledge and we know it's much bigger. Oh, the curse um, of knowledge. Well, right. Mm-hmm. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we want them to get further. Yeah. Um, so it's again, for us, it's dialing it back at mm-hmm. that point. Um, but that growth mindset, the nature of life, it is just such a dynamic thing is life and being what we know now, we didn't know 10 years ago. We didn't know 20 years ago. And to think that we would stop at some point, we can't even imagine the technology that's going to exist. Oh, gosh. Right? Mm-hmm. And when we think about the jobs that our kids are going to have, there's a, there are different statistics about whether they exist or not. And it's, you know, it ranges from one out of 10 jobs um, will never, won't ever come again in a year. Te- technology changes every six months. Uh, we have new AirPods that came out yesterday. I don't know if you saw them. No, I did yeah. not. I don't even have one pair of AirPods. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I just got a pair. And I'm like, oh, these are kind of cool. My kids <laughs> have had them for a, like a year. Right. Um, you know, so I think that that growth mindset is like w- what we knew 10 years ago and what we're going to know 10 years ago, 10 years from now. We can't even we can't even wrap our heads around it, mm-hmm. really. Um, so and then the grit piece, that's it. I find grit a really interesting word. Um, because at some point grit also becomes stubborn. Mm. If you Hmm. think about your perseverance towards something that at what point do you cut bait? Because sometimes grit being able to pick yourself up, so to speak, and digging in for everything can also steer us wrong. That might be where that critical thinking piece comes in. (laughs) Right. Like at what point do I cut bait? Because this is not going the direction I need it to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think that with that with that stubbornness there comes pride Mm -hmm. and that pride makes someone stop like my ego suddenly gets bigger like i've gone this far i need to keep doing it versus oh yeah you're watching this happen in real time and you're going you don't need to go any further like stop it stop it (laughs) right turn around right and as parents (laughs) stop right and as parents like we that more that grit piece is like have i created roots in my kid so that when someone tries to pull them out of their soil, they actually have the, f- like the strength and the fortitude to, t- to know where they stand. Mm-hmm. And it may or may not be associated with grit. Mm-hmm. It's what holds them down, what's, what grounds them. And so if they're going to be a leader, is there that ability to go, oh, I see this from a different perspective. Yeah. And it's not about being stubborn. You know, it's about also opening your eyes and seeing what the other person, what their experience may have been. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think grit's a really interesting word. Hmm. Hmm. Never looked at it from that perspective. It's a very good yeah. point. There is a point at some point when you might need to decide this is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'm going to go do another direction. thing. Right. Can make another plan. Right. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. I've heard so often that really since I was a little kid, readers are leaders. Mm-hmm. And, um, I kind of hated that a little bit because I, I did, at, at some point in my life, I didn't like reading. I've, mm-hmm. I've rediscovered it, but um, I, I digress. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, no, it's true. Why, why do they say readers are leaders? Mm-hmm. Well, and you would give me some heads up on some of the questions. And my response to that was, I think it's less about the reading other than we're, taken, we're transported into other worlds. I love that. Right. So mm-hmm. you are suddenly, again, back to perspective taking. Mm-hmm. I'm able to see from a different lens based on what I read. And uh, I love, for example, our, our children's school, their school sent out something saying, hey, we're not going to censor what your kids read. And I'm thinking, thank you, because we don't censor what our kids read. Mm-hmm. Like, they're going to have some level of developmental, oh, I'm comfortable reading this or I'm not. What I want them to do is to read something that, that does make them, pushes them into a different direction. I think the reading piece, though, it, it goes right back to that critical thinking part. When I read something, I have to discern how I feel about it and what I think about it and how I can transport what I've read into the real world. Um, I read tons of nonfiction, okay? Not everyone digs nonfiction, but I'm, I like leadership stuff. I like um, engaged individuals. I like community, like social change sort of. Like I enjoy reading it. It's not for everyone. Mm-hmm. It's not going to make me a leader because I read it. It's that it's feeding my brain Mm -hmm. and it's causing me to go, huh, I wonder, what do I think of this? And I think good leaders with 
quotes on good, right? Good leaders, they live that every day that they look at it and they go, huh, I wonder how what I'm going to do is going to affect this other person. And I think that's what reading does. Um, I have a couple kids, I have three kids and two love to read. They'll pick up everything. And one enjoys reading pastime wise, would much rather be out there doing something. That person, that's that child of mine is an incredible leader. Yeah. Because they're also kinesthetically experiencing life and able to go, huh, I wonder what I think about that. Mm -hmm. They're uh, all three of my kids really enjoy conversation with other people. They ask good questions. And uh, there are times where I know that the it has nothing to do with what they're reading. It's about back to relationships. It's mm -hmm. about are they actually connected to that other person and asking questions that both connects them individually but also challenges them to think about what does this mean for me? Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the values that we want to instill in our kids mm -hmm. to be I keep saying strong leaders I know I it's okay like yeah, yeah. <laughs> no 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 you aren't because we effective. do want them to be effective effective leaders. effective is a great word um, effective but I, I think that one of the things about reading um, that's beautiful is that it brings you into other people's mm -hmm. worlds and can give you a perspective because we we so often live in the bubble mm -hmm. you know of who we know you know like we're certain dis degrees of separation from mostly everybody that looks like us for the mm -hmm. most part but reading brings you into a whole different world with a different perspective and a t totally different experience and I think that the more people and experiences you understand the better you're going to be as a leader mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are some of the other values in your opinion that we should instill in our kids as yeah, far well, as leadership. Yeah, and, and actually back to the reading thing, you're making the assumption that people are reading diverse Right, I totally materials, making that assumption. Right? Yeah. There mm -hmm. are lots of people, though, that read the same thing over and over and over yeah. again. And um, let's use romance novels, right? If I'm always reading a no romance novel, I'm gonna, it's going to shape how I see the world. So <laughs> Shape your romances. Right, it is. <laughs> for real or for fake? <laughs> right? like, probably not for good. <laughs> <laughs> probably not for good. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, we make the assumption that, that that's what's drawing into it. You lead to this, for me, a philosophy of empathetic leadership, which is that ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It is a skill that we would want to build in our kids as leaders is knowing that any decision that you do it has consequences for other people mm -hmm. right that it has impact on other people that's what effective leaders are able to do as well that when I do x is it only affecting me or is it actually affecting other people um, some other skills is that service component mm. is that ability to you know, not be the one that has to stand up and lead on, so to speak, or like carry the carry the mantle for everyone. It is that sense of service to others. I've heard it called a servant leader. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And servant leader, for me, says that you're willing to put down sometimes what it is that you like to step back too far sometimes. And so I think self-sacrificing ends up with servant leaders mm -hmm. whereas service leadership really is that commitment to other people saying we're in service together mm -hmm. that we want something better we want to have some kind of something change mm. um that's good so adaptability key mm. piece yes not the same as flexibility right flexibility mm -hmm. is hey we have a meeting next week at 10 i can't make it can we meet at nine mm -hmm. and then we go back to the regular pattern right, right. adaptability is middle school science hey yeah. Our habitat has changed. Can mm -hmm. we navigate our habitat together? So I think that sense of adaptability without being compliant mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So adaptable to the point that I'm like, sweet, this is working. Mm -hmm. we, ha we adapted because the world changed yes. or situations changed. Um, so what other skills do we want? You mentioned humility. That's yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. And I'm not, sh I think humility is a practice. Mm. Um, I'm Talk not sure that that's, yeah, I'm not sure that it's always a behavior that people do because humility requires me to be self-aware. Mm -hmm. It requires me to recognize that I'm able to build you up without, without building myself down, so mm. to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a practice, just like passion is a practice, but it's not really a behavior, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I can be passionate about something, but you might not know it because I might not ever say it, but I'm always doing something. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that that, that that sense of having 
clear vision, helping kids with visioning. Uh, goal well, setting is always one. good too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and for the visioning piece is being able to envision yourself as whatever it is that you want to be or wherever it is that you want to go or what like being able to vision and bring along people with you Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty um sounds super idealistic and inspiring but I do think the ability to see beyond yourself is an important skill yes Um, communication fundamentally good communication skills Mm -hmm. which involves listening and uh yeah I think just good communication skills being able to give feedback receive feedback um, workplace competencies wise those are pretty strong elements that we would be looking at for our I don't care if you're 16 getting your first job the ability to communicate and the ability to ask for feedback mm. and uh, as parents we get it pretty directly right like our kids remind us of how incompetent we are daily <laughs> right <laughs> I'm like hey I thought I was really good at something oh no you're not <laughs> um, but that's their way of giving us feedback mm-hmm if they respond to us in a way, they're telling us that our leadership as a parent, we, did, we didn't do something well. Mm-hmm. And uh, rather, it goes back to the humility. Rather than pushing up against it, taking a moment as parents to go, okay, I'm going to assess this for myself. Um, and that's really hard. That is so good. That's one of the ones I identified. I do want to mention that somebody on online is saying, what's the topic today? So I don't want them <laughs> to be in the dark. We are talking about developing leadership in our children. And uh, today our guest is Mariam McGregor. And uh, she is what I called earlier a leadership guru. <laughs> so thanks for so much for listening in. I do want to talk about the accountability. Mm-hmm. Now, accountability is something that I've grown to um feel that is valuable as an adult Mm -hmm. that is not something that I felt like was valuable as a child so how is that something how can we build a value to have somebody holding us accountable Mm -hmm. in children sure because I think just from from life and realizing oh I don't I don't get everything Mm -hmm. and I um and I need that help that accountability I think that's why I've just as an adult developed that but so how do kids how do we do that with kids? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, my colleagues, we actually talk about this regularly because we talk about being engaged in the work that we do. And for everyone to bring your 100% in the morning, have a workplace or an environment, whether it's school, whether it's family, where you can be your best and then go home with your 100% at the end of the day, right? And if there's something in between not going well, we need to strive to fix that. Um, and And one of the things that we talk about is, I don't want to necessarily hold you accountable. I want to help you become an accountable person. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like I don't, I good. don't because accountability is setting rules and principles and parameters externally. I want it to be something for you where you go, oh, if something's not happening, wait, I actually have control on this because I'm an accountable person. Mm. I want to be accountable. I walk down the street, I see a piece of trash. I'm not waiting for you to say, pick up the trash. I pick up the trash Mm. instead of walking by it. So it's the same theory that I have about when I worked at the alternative school in Colorado. It was, and it was a lot of stopouts and dropouts and kids that were engaged in, um, nefarious behaviors they were gangs and they you know 40 percent of our students were parents by the time they were oh wow 16 Mm -hmm. 17 years old 40 percent were involved in gangs 90 percent had substance abuse issues either their their own or systemic to their family Mm -hmm. so if i'm talking about holding them accountable mm -mm. they already are being held accountable right they have huge responsibilities and consequences and parameters and people judging and like they have that already the nature is to cultivate that internal accountable sense and it changed for them when it was I believe that you're a leader Mm. I know that you can make impact I recognize that you're the assistant manager at Dairy Queen and you have to fire someone and you're 17 and I'm thinking I'm not worried that you're not being held accountable you know who's not being held accountable is your manager (laughs) (laughs) because that's way above your pay grade right however for individuals at that point at 17 or 18 years old to feel like they've got agency in it Mm -hmm. that to me is really much more powerful is that they've got something internally driving them as an accountable person Mm. 
I think that's also just a self-love sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Just having a an appreciation for who you are and um and who you've been made to be. Mm-hmm. And that I think some of that building some of that in in people is important, and that only comes from relationships as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a lens of privilege as well as to be able to say, "I want you to become self-actualized. I want you to have this sense <laughs> that you can be more than," um, because not everyone is looking at the world like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you do have people that are thinking about survival from the moment they wake up to when they go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. And so as much as we're saying, I want my child to be a leader, we've got to really define the word for for why that's an important characteristic of the other people walking next to us down the sidewalk. Yeah. Um, Because it is, everyone has a different perspective and a different experience. I saw in one of your blog posts that you communicate it to your kids that you expect them to wait tables and work in a service job at least once in their lives. So (laughs) tell us why you've set that (laughs) expectation. Uh, Yeah, I think because it does go to recognizing that you're not too good for anything Mm. ever. Your first job is your first job. Your service to other people and recognizing and experiencing something that requires you to be um, helping other people. I think it's a really, it's just really key to for all of us is to know what it means to put ourselves um, second. And that's what service jobs do, is that you are literally creating an experience for other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whether you're folding clothes or you're, you know, doing cash, a cash register. Um, my Our oldest, his first job was at Chipotle. And uh, oh, man, Chipotle. love Shout it, out. right? <laughs> uh, if free food if you work there sort of thing like I mean when you're on your shift it was bonus at 16 years old uh, had a phenomenal manager that really recognized that this was their first job and it's front of the house it's frontline sort of work and you don't know what people come into that environment they're hungry they're hangry Mm -hmm. they're like barking at you and to be able to keep your cool and to recognize that it's not you yeah it's them and it's your responsibility to help them have an experience because you are also branded with whatever it is, wherever it is you work and that customer experience piece of it. And I think service, service jobs do that. It mm-hmm. reminds us that other people are demanding something from us mm-hmm. and yet we can keep our cool and we can engage in a, com- in a conversation or a relationship. And ultimately that's the citizen leadership piece. You know, you, you're, Everyone every day walks around and has the potential to be a citizen leader, to just do the right thing in that moment. Mm. It's not a big ask. Just do the right thing in that moment. Do you remember the show Undercover Boss? Yes. I loved that. Yeah. And if you haven't seen that show, the kind of the premise of it is that they're the CEO of a major company would come and they would disguise said person, he, he him or her, um, and have them do kind of the grunt work Mm -hmm. they would be and i hate to say grunt work but some of it was Mm -hmm. some of it's dirty jobs and Mm -hmm. stuff but they would have them do jobs that um maybe they've never ever done and kind of get the perspective of the people that are working under them from the ground up Mm -hmm. and i love that um because you you really it does it makes you a more caring leader Mm -hmm. and it it, all the other thing that it helped them do is get an understanding of what was happening because sometimes you implement these um, procedures and plans and all of these things on high and Mm -hmm. in a bubble and then they would come down and go oh so that really didn't work well for any of you (laughs) the real people executing it Uh right just like our kids the real people experience like the hard work being done while parents we might feel like it's really hard work the hard work being done is growing up Uh, mm -hmm. it's our kids that are trying to figure out all these things and how do we create an environment where they can do it and they can do it as a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You touched on this a little bit a couple of minutes ago, um, communication skills. What kind of communication skills do we need to be developing in our kids Mm -hmm. to be effective leaders? Right. Well, I can jump in on this one. Okay. (laughs) do that (laughs) it is rough well I mean one of the things is that you will frequently hear people say that I just avoid conflict Mm. conflict is a communication skill yeah oh you know and it's not that we're either in conflict or out of conflict we're at stages of conflict Mm. 
And while I might be churning inside, you have no idea because I haven't said anything Mm -hmm. until I blow up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whereas if I had said, hey, this may not have been your intention to do X, Y, or Z. Can we talk about it? Because this is how it affected me. That's a communication skill and it diffuses conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, conflict and opposition are two different things, right? Conflict is that my values are being threatened. Mm. You've said something that... Um, pushes a button for me whereas opposition is we just have a different point of view and we talk about it and we appreciate it about each other that again is a communication skill is the appreciation sense of truly truly listening and then we might still disagree but we go get coffee (laughs) right and we hug each other yeah because we're good Mm -hmm. right that's a communication skill is being able to recognize that I don't need you to have the same view as me right I just want to be able to communicate with you. Again, sharing perspective. Um, I think the ability to step back and listen is Mm -hmm. also key. It's a great one. It's key. It's very, very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And to listen without trying to script something or prepare my response. (laughs) I'm pointing at her. You can't see me if you're not on Facebook Live, but that's a good one. Right? We're always, people are always scripting, which means they've stopped listening. Mm -hmm. And good leaders. you're preparing your response instead of listening. Totally. Yeah. Right? I'm no longer in empathy. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer in humility as Mm -hmm. a leader because I'm just preparing to battle against you, which again, isn't communication. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's that sense of figuring out when is it, there's a right and a right. Like, it doesn't have to be a right and a wrong perspective. It's a, oh, interesting perspective. Good leaders do that, that they're able to go, oh, I might not have it right this time. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Again, it gets into that prescriptive right and wrong sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so the other things about communication is, especially for kids, um, and we know the statistics around social media and communication that happens, the secret life of bees, so to speak, of kids and their texts and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, is the ability to have, understand nonverbal communication. Oh, and that's so good. <laughs> physical presence. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm 4'11". People, I'm 4'11", <laughs> right? I bought and paid for. I wear heels every day. However... People don't always recognize that when you're, unless you're paying attention to each other. Mm -hmm. It's about presence and it's about just um, those nonverbal pieces of communication as well. And yeah, there's just a lot of interesting research on that and what's going to happen from communication text wise. Lack of mm -hmm. actually. Lack of actual physical presence Mm -hmm. with people. How do, is, is, is that something that you just model with your children and, and helping them to, when they are in the presence mm. of someone, to pick up on verbal cues? Is that how mm-hmm. you would teach them is just modeling and saying, you know, did you see how she kind of pulled back when mm-hmm. I, whatever. I how love do do that. that? Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. Like the way you just described that and even physically you were responding to it. Like I could see you coaching your kid that way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Because less advice and more coaching because mm-hmm. they don't know. Right. So, hey, honey, when you see someone, eyes on them, please. Big one. Or teaching kids from a very young age to shake hands. Oh, gosh, that's okay? good. It's, it's a characteristic that it, it changes how people respond to them. Our kids, and I'm sure there are many people out there that your kids, when you can help them make eye contact and shake a hand, it's remarkable the response that happens. And sure, it's a very traditional behavior at the same time it gets them in the door later on and recognizing like I can look you in the eye. I can carry on a conversation. Um, So yeah, I think some of it is that coaching. It's the, Hey, we're going to something, put your phone down, (laughs) right? Like eyes on the prize sort of thing. That definitely is with modeling. It is modeling. (laughs) And sometimes it does. We have to actually say it like, Hey, we're going to this event. Now is not the time to have your phone. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do to make that happen? Um, I mean, our kids park their phones every night. They don't go up in their rooms. We've got a technology table, and um, it's pretty clear when your head has to be out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Modeling, if you get have the opportunity and privilege to eat dinner with your kids regularly, is to have conversation and to model even body language. Then, like if my kid's slouching, we're gonna have a conversation Mm -hmm. about it. Like, hey, long day. Like, I need to get to the root of it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if they say, no, I'm fine. Well, it's horrific. Let's sit up. (laughs) (laughs) 
Tell your body. <laughs> Tell your body, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to bed at 8.30. <laughs> so this is something that I've, I've thought quite a bit about. So there are different personality, not, yes, yeah, mm-hmm. personality mm-hmm. types, but mm-hmm. also just how do we nurture our kids when they have a different leadership style of our own? For example, mm-hmm. I am a type A more mm-hmm. aggressive, eager to get everything done, get it done quickly type of person, right? Mm-hmm. My husband, on the other hand, is type B, laid back, more person, uh, more patient type mm-hmm. of person. And um, I know that as a type A, I have the tendency to think that my way of leading is the right way. Mm-hmm. And so what do we do? How, what do we need to keep in mind to nurture our kids when they don't have our personality type? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually I would, uh, and people that know me will recognize this language, like really what you're talking about is what you're motivated by, Mm. and you being motivated by performance, which is about getting stuff done, it may or may not be that you're a type A personality, it's that you're actually motivated by getting things done, Mm. whereas your husband, using that example, may be motivated by people, I genuinely care for you, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to make choices because I genuinely care for you, and so... I don't, he could be in the finance industry, which is a pretty competitive in environment. And he's still motivated by people because he genuinely cares. And why did he go into finance? Because he wants people to learn how to use their money to build a better life. Whereas you might go into that same industry, and this is the same for our kids. You might go into it because you're like, I'm competitive. I want to be able to sell the best product. I want to hit my numbers. I want like same industry, different way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Same for our kids. Your kid might play football or soccer and they don't play like you Mm -hmm. because they're motivated by something different when they're on the field Mm -hmm. they might choose to play an instrument they might choose to be a writer they might choose to pursue a career that you're thinking oh my gosh I would not want to go into data analysis I can't even imagine spending my day that and your kids like love it I want to do it and you're thinking I don't get it so again it's that navigation what do they need they need your support and for them to be the leader that, that they are designed to be, support them with it and model when they do something where you're like, ooh, how would a leader do that? Mm. I've had more than one of those conversations with our kids like, hey, a leader, how do you think a leader might handle that same situation? And they are telling me their own vocabulary around the kind of leader that they want to be. Mm, I love that. And then we can nurture it from there mm-hmm. because if a kid says you use the word aggressive if kid says well I'd be in there and I'd do this and then I would potentially say well so what if I don't respond to that in a positive way how's that going to affect you as a leader so we're nurturing them in a way that is not right it's still around our style but it's around their style yeah because you might go being aggressive in that situation not going to pay off right so how do we soften that and you can still get what you need honey (laughs) <laughs> you just have to do it differently. Right. And I love that you said, how would somebody that maybe isn't your same personality mm-hmm. respond in that situation? That's something that I'm really just learning now because mm. I've been an entrepreneur for years and I've had a small business and I've led myself. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> now that I'm leading more people, I'm having to learn how they work best mm-hmm. and how they are motivated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, lo- I love that you said that that was um, that's their very vital or mm-hmm. useful information. Um, and I think that the other thing is, is that we need to be flexible about what our definition of success is. Um, just in those two types of people, the, uh, you know, my husband and myself, mm-hmm. you were saying in the finance field, his definition of success is people are living their best life and they're financially stable and whatnot versus the other person might say that my, my definition of success is six digit figure right they made tons of money <laughs> yes. exactly made they're making more 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 and more. game exactly yeah. and mm-hmm. and both of them are okay exactly it's that your lens is different mm-hmm. um yeah it is i just think that's why i don't know as my seriously my grandmother used to say this all the time she's like that's why there's chocolate and vanilla ice cream honey mm-hmm. and i'd always think oh that's so corny and then you grow up and you go oh right some people like it smooth and some people like it chunky. Mm-hmm. How do we navigate both of those? Mm-hmm. And how do we create an environment? How do we create the place that we live, the school that we go to, the way that we do the work that we do so that we're honoring everyone that's in that environment? That's what good, strong, effective leaders, whatever word it is that we want to put there, that's what effective leadership is. And we don't tell the chunky peanut butter people that they're wrong. <laughs> I know. I'm married to one. <laughs> 
I don't get it, but if that's your deal. Right? But I'll take like texture in my ice cream, but not texture in my peanut butter. <laughs> Okay, so real quick, before uh-huh. we, we leave, I don't want to, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't discuss some of the practical ways we can mm-hmm. encourage our kids to start taking on leadership roles. What are some everyday things that we can help them engage in? Sure. Well, one is to let them do it. So create spaces where you let them do it. And they might not do it the way that you want them to do it, but to create environments where they can do it. Um, when they, so even our, uh, I'm thinking one of my kids was a, like 11 or something played a sport and the coach came he was having an issue with the coach and I said terrific it's your coach go talk to your coach well I don't know and we practiced before he went and talked to his coach and then had a conversation the coach came over and was chatting with me and recanted or recounted everything that our child had said to him and I said well that's terrific you're his coach I don't really need to know about it you're his coach it sounds like y'all figured it out Hmm. so letting them do it giving them the opportunity where if they want to run something by you and coach them through that and give them, again, different than the scripting where I'm listening to, but give them a practice script where they've got to advocate for themselves. Um, Those are ways to do it as well, like practice the words, but let them pick their words. That's good leadership too, is don't choose my words, choose your words. Right, because they are them and you are you. Totally. (laughs) Yeah. And they're 11 or 12 or 16 or whatever, or or seven. Valid. you know, I do think that some of the more traditional things in school, student councils, those are great because it does allow people who are motivated by having some kind of position or some kind of recognizable role in doing change or influence in their schools. They're terrific. We need to let them do more, you know, when they come up with ideas that, again, isn't a health or safety issue. <laughs> There's no risk management around it. <laughs> um, it's okay to dial back on those ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to say, tell me more about this. And to create, again, an opportunity for our kids starting in third grade, second grade. I mean, they know what can make their school better. Third mm-hmm. graders, they totally can. Um, they can peer mentor. They can be reading buddies for their for younger kids. They can recognize what it means to create around empathy. Kids with special needs, which is near and dear to our heart. Uh, that sense of, um, I have responsibility because I'm able-bodied. Or I can think through things. Or... Um, I, you know, I'm able to do the things that I want to do. That's another everyday way that you can do it is, again, build empathy, the empathy muscle. Put them in a space where they are a little uncomfortable, mm-hmm. a little bit where they go, huh, I don't know how I would do that. And then talk with them. It's an everyday way. Um, I use the trash example. If they walk by a piece of trash yeah. and they don't pick it up, I mean, that is a moment in time where it's looking at them and either saying, pick up the trash which again is super instructive or picking up the trash in front of them and throwing it away Hmm. it's modeling the way in a lot of ways Um, but if we're motivated by performance sometimes we think modeling is going to get it like how can they not see that i'm doing this (laughs) we have to then say look right (laughs) right like (laughs) modeling is not always effective yeah it might be hey did you happen to notice in that situation how i dealt with that what would you do in that same situation? Hmm. It's an everyday thing. That's so good. Um, super basic things like when neighbors ask you, can your child water our plants or watch our cat or whatever? Absolutely yes. Even at young ages and then walking with them or being with them and saying, so how would you do this? And instead of doing it for them, being partners with them and having them show you, oh, I'm responsible. I'm taking care of my neighbor's plants. It's a leadership skill. hmm uh-huh. Again, recognizing that someone has asked you to do something and you're fulfilling what it is and you're now an accountable person. Mm-hmm. I think that a couple of things that we've we've been working on with our kids, each and every one of them has their own business. Mm, cool. Um, one, my daughter, who's seven today. Happy mm-hmm. birthday, Christina. Yay. She uh, has a rock collect well she collects rocks and then she decorates them Mm -hmm. and then sells them Mm -hmm. Um, my middle child's kind of he's nine he's kind of trying to figure out he does just kind of odd jobs really Mm -hmm. Um, my oldest child is the wreath master that's what he's called himself he makes christmas wreaths that are really quite beautiful actually (laughs) but last year he did he he could have racked up he actually had a um a waiting list mm-hmm. he had so many requests but we what we are trying to do is just build in them um, responsibility um, there's so many skills that come with entrepreneurship mm-hmm. um, 
But an, another thing that we've done with our 11 year old is just in the morning, we, I, I put him in charge of getting the kids out the door. Mm-hmm. Now that takes some some guts. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Cuz he's 11 and he's not necessarily as motivated to be on time as mom right. is. Um but he's got dealing with his 9-year-old brother and his 7-year-old sister and he, they he's got to keep them on track and accountable to do all the things. Mm-hmm. And you know, he's growing in that and actually he really does want to be on time cuz he wants to get to school in time to hang out before school sure. starts. Sure. So he's got something so that's inspiring. So he's got some motivation. Him. Yeah, yeah, he totally absolutely. does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, when our kids were little, uh, littler, um, we had something called a paw chart, and it was only because the stickers looked like paws. And everything oh. that they earned was around a, a leadership characteristic. So it was things like, except for the three-year-old, like it was stay in bed without getting out at the end of the night. Amen. Okay, right? It's a behavior, though. What are we doing really is like the day is over. You're going to turn your brain off. Guess what? Um, but there were things like you could do a random act of kindness. You could actually give a sibling paw, which means you saw your sibling do something that was acknowledged that it was cool. You could earn five paws and then you earned a dollar. But you couldn't earn all five paws in the same category. You oh. actually had to earn Ooh, five so paws in a different category to earn your dollar. And then you could wait till the end of the week and then you get all of your dollars or you could wait and then we'd match it to go to the bank. So what are we doing? We're building all these skills, right? This is all leader. It's patience. It's recognizing. It's noticing other people. It's communicating. It's all these characteristics versus one of those, like random act of kindness, that might be really easy for you. Mm -hmm. So you're going to rack up the five paws in that. And it's like, but that's not building a holistic kid. It's not wrecking, like, that's not a leadership perspective. That's just like, ooh, sweet, I'm taking the easy one. Right. Because that's easy for me. Right. So that's one thing. I actually, there's a blog post on the publisher's page about that on the PAW chore chart. That's okay. what we called it. We'll make sure we, we yeah. get your information on our website so that you know that we're actually out of time. Oh, that I'm was so fast. sad. I know it went <laughs> fast. <laughs> It was good. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we will definitely have um, the resources for, uh, we'll have Mariam's website on uh, the school days dot com school days show dot com website and um, also she has a, a lot of other resources that um, will be helpful to you so we'll make sure that we have those available to you um, at the end of every show we want to make sure that um, you guys know what's going on so school days is sponsored by noggin educational foundation so we always want to let you know what's going on with noggin if you happen to be in the dfw area we would like to we and would like to lend us a hand we would love for you to join us we are in the process of getting a jump on organizing activities for our summer math and reading program and we welcome students who want to get some of those volunteer hours in before the semester is over so drop me a line at donita at nogginfoundation.org my name is spelled d-o-n-e-d-a and whether or not you're in the dallas fort worth area or not there are plenty of ways to help us by donating your time head to nogginfoundation.org and explore all the ways you can volunteer with noggin educational foundation if you're new to the show my husband david was my school days co-host and in August he returned back to the classroom for his 11th year of teaching. He is the owner and lead coach of uh, Noggin Educational Coaching and Noggin is going international. David and his team now offer virtual coaching. So Noggin's clients can now enjoy the convenience of online coaching and have the ability to rewind and play back coaching sessions, which is pretty great because you might not be taking go- notes and you might really be like, well, what did he say about X equals what? So that's that's kind of a nice thing to do. So if you want to reach out to David, drop him a line at info at noggineducation.com. Next week on School Days, we'll sit down with dual language specialist Debbie Strand and Anna Munoz, ELL specialist from Mansfield ISD. And joining me in the guest co-host chair will be Amanda Ibarra, who is a fellow entrepreneur and podcaster with three boys in a dual language program. So don't forget to share with your parent friends about that one. As always, head to our website, schooldaysshow.com, for more information about all that's going on and for the resources mentioned in School Days. Remember, you don't ever have to miss a show. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and pretty much anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Noggin Foundation. That's N-O-G-G-I-N. And last but 
not least, we like to end our show by saying that David and I are parenting by grace. We depend on God to give us the wisdom and strength that we need for to raise our kids into flourishing adults. And if you'd like to know more about that, feel free to email me at info at schooldazedshow.com. Have a great week. School Dazed is sponsored by Noggin Educational Foundation. At Noggin, we provide free educational resources to students from low-income families and support to their parents like the preceding broadcast. School Days is made possible by the generosity of listeners just like you. Please consider donating to Noggin at Noggin, N-O-G-G-I-N, foundation.org. I'm Sugar. I'm Spice. And I'm Rain. Welcome to our show, True Talk, No Lies, born out of life's sweet truths. Three.